There are a lot of really technical, tricky concepts in AI engineering. Today we're explaining them in the absolute simplest way possible, like you're five years old. Okay, realistically, maybe like 15 years old, but you get the idea. This video won't get into the details, obviously. Instead, my goal is that by the end, you have a high-level intuition for the main topics in AI engineering today, so you can dig into more technical tutorials with confidence. Let's get started. So what is AI engineering? AI engineering is the process of building applications with readily available foundation models. We'll talk about foundation models in a minute. In practice, AI engineers start from off-the-shelf models, often via an API, adapt them with prompting or one of the other techniques we'll talk about, and deploy them somewhere for people to use. They make sure the AI-powered application has proper evaluation, monitoring, security guardrails, cost controls, and good enough performance. This is different from machine learning engineering, which focuses more on creating and improving models themselves, working with data, training models, and optimizing architectures and metrics. So in the definition of AI engineering, we use the term foundation model. A foundation model is a large AI model trained on a big data set, like text, images, and videos from the internet, that can be adapted to many downstream tasks. It's a general base model that you can customize for specific uses like a support bot or coding assistant instead of training from scratch. The foundation label highlights that these are powerful building blocks, but still incomplete without being adapted to a specific task. This might sound like an LLM, and that makes sense. Large language models are a type of foundation model that are trained to guess the next piece of text after reading huge amounts of writing. Because they get very good at these guesses, they can summarize, answer questions, translate, and write code. They don't retrieve facts like a database. They encode lots of real-world knowledge in their parameters and generate likely text, so they can be right, but also confidently wrong. We've had text models for a long time, but the main reason modern LLMs perform so well is because of a change to the way the model works, specifically the introduction of the transformer architecture. The transformer architecture is a model design that allows training to happen in parallel, which makes very large models practical. Most modern foundation models use this design. This model design also lets each word in a sentence pay attention to other words, not just the ones next to it. This makes it good at handling long or tricky sentences and connections like the dog that chased the cat was brown. The attention mechanism is how a model decides which part of the input matters. Multiple attention heads can focus on different things at once, like who a pronoun refers to or the tone of a sentence. This learning usually means clearer, more accurate outputs. Speaking of learning, if you want to go from understanding these concepts at a high level to actually building AI applications, you'll need hands-on practice. That's where today's sponsor, DataCamp, comes in. DataCamp has two excellent AI engineering tracks that I've been really impressed with. First is their Associate AI Engineer for Data Scientist track. It's a series of courses covering everything from machine learning fundamentals to transformers, prompt engineering, and fine tuning. But what really sets it apart is the MLOps coverage. You'll learn MLflow, version control with Git, automated testing, and CI/CD concepts that most courses completely skip. For developers, there's also the Associate AI Engineer for Developers track, 12 courses plus projects where you'll actually build real applications like chatbots, semantic search engines using OpenAI API, Hugging Face, Langchain, and Pinecone. Again, they include the crucial deployment and monitoring skills you'll actually need in production. What I love about DataCamp is it's all browser-based with interactive coding environments, so you can start practicing immediately without any setup. Plus, they have built-in AI helpers to guide you when you're stuck. Check out DataCamp using the link in the description to start building these AI engineering skills hands-on. Now back to the concepts. One thing that comes up a lot in AI and ML is the idea of a model learning. When we say a model is learning, we mean that it's updating its parameters. Parameters are the internal numbers that control the model's behavior. During training, the computer adjusts these numbers until the model makes fewer mistakes. Model parameters can capture more patterns, but they also cost more to store and run. Model parameters are the numbers that the model learns during training. Hyperparameters are numbers that we set. One important setting is called temperature. Think of it like a creativity dial. Low temperature makes the model stick to safe, predictable answers, which is great when you need accurate facts. High temperature makes it more creative and surprising, perfect for brainstorming or writing stories, but riskier if you need more precise information. Temperature works with two other controls called top K and top P. These limit which words the model can choose next. Top K says only pick from the K most likely words. So if K is five, the model can only choose from its top five guesses. Top P is a little bit smarter. 
It builds a pool of words until their combined likelihood hits a certain percentage, like 90%. This pool grows or shrinks depending on how confident the model is, giving you a nice balance of consistency and creativity. Although technically, models aren't actually returning words. They're returning tokens. A token is like a small chunk of text. Sometimes it's a whole word like cat. Sometimes it's just part of a word like un from unhappy. And sometimes it's punctuation. The model reads and writes one token at a time, kind of like how you might read letter by letter when you're first learning to read. When people talk about how long a model's memory is, they're counting tokens, not words. Speaking of memory, model context is basically how much text the model can remember and work with at once. Think of it like your working memory when reading a book. You can keep track of the current chapter and maybe the last few chapters, but not the entire book series at once. Context includes your conversation history, the prompt, any documents you've shared, and the response being generated. Models have context limits. When you hit that limit, the model starts forgetting the oldest parts to make room for new information. This is why very long conversations sometimes lose track of things you said at the beginning. When we chat with a model, we are prompting the model, right? And the prompt makes a big difference for the kind of output we get. Prompt engineering is a fancy way of saying writing really good instructions. You can tell the model what role to play, like you are a helpful teacher, what format you want, like give me bullet points, and what rules to follow, like always include your sources. Good prompts are like giving clear directions. They help the model understand what you want and give more consistent results. There are actually two types of prompts. The system prompt is like the house rules. It sets the model's default behavior and stays the same for every conversation. The user prompt is your specific request right now. Think of the system prompt as telling someone you're a professional email writer and the user prompt as write an email declining this meeting. Sometimes you don't need to give examples in your prompt. You just ask the model to do something and it figures it out. That's called zero shot learning like asking, translate this to Spanish without showing any examples first. But often showing a few examples works way better. That's few shot learning. You include a handful of examples in your prompt to show the exact style you want. The model then copies your pattern for your new request. This is all part of something called in-context learning. You're not permanently changing the model. You're just teaching it temporarily within one conversation by including examples right in your message. If you want more permanent changes, you can use fine tuning. This actually retrains the model on your own examples, so it consistently behaves a certain way. Unlike prompting, this time you're actually changing the model's internal parameters. It's useful for specialized language like medical or legal writing, or getting a very specific tone or output format. It costs more time and money than prompting, but you'll probably get more reliable results. Full fine tuning can be expensive, so there's a shortcut we use called PEFT, Parameter Efficient Fine Tuning. Instead of changing the entire model, you just add a small adapter layer on top. It's like editing just part of a document versus rewriting the entire document from scratch. You get most of the benefits of fine tuning with way less compute and storage. LoRa is an example of PEFT. Two other ways to make models more practical are quantization and distillation. Quantization is like compressing a high resolution photo. You store the model's numbers with fewer bits, which makes it smaller and faster while keeping most of the quality. Distillation is different. In this case, you train a smaller student model to copy a larger teacher model. The student learns from both the teacher's answers and how confident it is about them. You end up with a faster, lighter model that keeps much of the original's knowledge and capabilities. Most consumer AI models go through one more step called preference fine tuning. Humans rate different model responses and the model learns to prefer answers that people like. This pushes it toward being more helpful, safe and polite rather than just technically correct. It's the difference between a model that can write and one that writes in a way humans actually want to read, or the difference between a sycophantic model and one that is more down to earth. Now, even the best models sometimes make stuff up or don't know recent information. That's where RAG comes in, retrieval augmented generation. Instead of just relying on what the model memorized during training, it first looks up relevant documents, maybe from a database, then writes its answer using that fresh information. This reduces made up facts and keeps answers current without having to retrain the whole model. RAG depends on something called embeddings. An embedding turns text into a list of numbers where similar meanings end up close together mathematically. So car and automobile would have very similar lists of numbers, even though they're very different words. This lets you search by meaning, not just exact word matches. 
These embeddings get stored in a vector database, which is basically a database that's really good at quickly finding the most similar embeddings to your question. When you ask something, the system finds the closest matching documents and feeds them to the model along with your question. Before documents go into the vector database, they get split up through chunking. You can't stuff an entire book into the model at once because of the context limit. So you break it into smaller pieces that are easier to search and process. If you go too big, you get a lot of irrelevant stuff. If you go too small, you lose this important context. After finding relevant chunks, ranking puts them in order of usefulness. The best evidence goes to the top, which leads to shorter, clearer, and more accurate answers. Under the hood, different parts of these systems use encoders and decoders. An encoder turns text into those compact numeric summaries that capture meaning, perfect for search and understanding. A decoder turns summaries back into human text, one token at a time, great for generating responses. Some models only encode, some only decode, and some do both. So far, we've talked about models that just chat, but agents can actually do things. An agent is like an AI assistant that can plan steps and take actions to reach a goal. It might search the web, read the results, do some calculations, write up an answer, and send it back to you. Agents can use memory from past conversations, retry when something fails, and adjust their plans. Agents work by calling tools. External abilities like web search, calculators, code runners, email, calendars, and databases. Tools let the model move from just words to actual actions. But how do agents actually use tools? It's actually pretty simple. When you build an agent, you give it access to functions it can call. For example, you might have a search web query function or a send to subject body function or a send email function. The agent doesn't run this code directly. Instead, it generates a special message saying, I want to call search web with the query weather in Paris and your application code actually makes that function call, then feeds the results back to the agent. All of this leads to inference, the moment when you actually run the trained model to get an answer. The model generates one token at a time, guided by your temperature and top K or top P settings. Cost depends on how many tokens you process and how big the model is. There are two main ways to do inference. Online inference serves answers in real time to live users, like ChatGPT responding as you type. It needs to be fast and handle traffic spikes smoothly. Batch inference processes lots of items offline, like overnight jobs. You trade instant responses for higher throughput and lower costs. It's perfect for things like classifying millions of reviews or summarizing archives. For online systems, latency matters a lot. Latency is the delay between asking a question and getting the first useful output. Users definitely notice the difference between 200 milliseconds and 2 seconds. Seconds. Streaming helps by showing partial results immediately instead of waiting for the complete answer. So we can evaluate how good our system is by how fast it returns results. But how do we know if the actual models we're using are any good? One way is with model benchmarks. Benchmarks are like standardized tests that compare models on skills like math, coding, reading comprehension, and safety. They're helpful for tracking progress, but they're not the whole story. Real world performance and human feedback still matter most. When researchers want to measure model performance more precisely, they use specific metrics. Here are three of the most common ones in AI engineering. Perplexity, blue, and rouge. Perplexity measures how surprised a model is by text it hasn't seen before. Lower perplexity means the model predicted the text better. It's less confused. Think of it like a reading comprehension test. If you can predict what comes next in a story, you probably understood it well. Blue and rouge are used for tasks like translation and summarization. Blue compares a model's output to reference correct answers by counting matching words and phrases. If a translation shares lots of words with a professional human translation, it gets a high blue score. Rouge is similar but focuses on re Call. How much of the important content did the model capture? It's especially useful for summarization. If a model's summary includes most of the key points from the original text, it gets a high rouge score. These metrics aren't perfect. A translation could have all the right words but still sound weird, or a summary could hit all the keywords but miss the main point. But they give researchers a quick, automated way to compare different models. Another way to tell how good the model is is to use one model to grade another model's answers. An LLM as judge scores responses against rules like followed instructions, used reliable sources, or clear writing. It's much faster and cheaper than using only human reviewers. Though it's not perfect, so spot checks are important. Finally, as AI systems get more complex, we need better ways for different parts to work together. MCP, or Model Context Protocol, is like a universal adapter that lets models, apps, and tools connect through the same interface. Instead of building custom integrations for everything, you just plug into the standard. It's about making AI systems that actually work together instead of being isolated little islands. And that wraps up our list of the main topics in AI engineering at a high level. I have a comprehensive 76 minute crash course that goes into way more detail, so check that out next. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.